right, we'll call this meeting of the Coring Township Board of Trustees to order at 6 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday, October 25th. Um, we will start with attendance, please. Mr. Baker. Ms. Orich. Here. Mr. Unger. Here. Mr. Waller. Here. Um, Mr. Weckback, do we have a need for an executive session? If so, under, under what ORC uh, guidelines? Yes, I would actually uh, request a motion from the board to enter into executive session concurrent with uh, High Revised Code Section 121.22 G1, which is to consider the employment and compensation of public employees, and in, in uh, consideration of G4, which is for collective bargaining sessions and reviewing the terms and conditions of their employment. I would motion that we go into executive sessions for the items detailed by Mr. Weckbach. I'll second. Any discussion? None. All right, uh, we'll call the question. Ms. Orch? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. We will go into executive session at 6.01. Please stand by uh, for a full report at 7 when we get back. Thank you. Good evening. Um, and uh, as we return from executive session um, for the Coring Township Board of Trustees meeting of October 25th at 7 p.m. in the township. Um, uh, Mr. Baker, attendance, please. Ms. Orch? Yeah, here. Ms. Ms. Runger? Here. Mr. Waller? Here. All are here. Uh, Mr. Weckback, is there anything to report from executive session? There is not. All right. Um, we will now move on to uh, do the pledge and a moment of silence and meditation. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America. Of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we just take a moment um, uh, of silent meditation to, for all those um, petitions we hold in our hearts and in all that we hold public and for the township, uh, our state, and our country. All right, thank you. All right, um, now a approval of minutes. Uh, you have been provided, we have been provided with uh, uh, minutes from Mr. Baker. Uh, are there any motions at this time? I motion that we would approve the minutes from the October 11th meeting. I'll second. Any discussion? I sent one uh, typo and I think you corrected it. No other comments. Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll call the question then for vote. Mr. Baker? Ms. Orch? Yes. Ms. Stronger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. We have uh, with us this evening a number of presentations, and we'll start with the fine folks at Fire and EMS with uh, Chief Walls uh, introducing and swearing in newly promoted employees. Chief, welcome. Good evening, board. Good evening to everyone in attendance this evening. It gives me great privilege to uh, introduce and swear in our three newest career firefighters. At this time, I would like Sam Woodward, Andrew Harrington, and Linnea Head to come up here and face the crowd. Sam tonight is going to be sworn in by his wife, Maria. He is a product of our Colerain recruit class and has an associate's degree in theology. Andrew will be penned tonight by his mother, Lynn. He graduated from the Butler Tech Fire Rescue Academy in December 2021, and he's currently attending the Colerain Paramedic Program. Linnea will be penned tonight by her husband, Will. She attended the Colerain Recruit class. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Xavier University, and I think it would be fair to say is an accomplished artist. <laughs> would that be fair? So at this time, I'm going to have Sam introduce his family. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, I'm here with my mom, Lynn, over there, my uh, sister, Caitlin, my niece, Zuri, <laughs> which is her club name, Disney, and then my friends, Alexis, Kylie, and Zuri, and back back there. Oh. Linnea? I'm here with my husband, Will, my dad, my brother, Ryan, and then my brother-in-law, Will, Kylie, and Zuri. Thank you. And at this time, then, everyone who's going to be uh, pinning badges, please come forward. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? Now, uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. I 
Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I guess Mr. Harrington will be the go-between because you have a philosophy major and a theology major. That oh, wow. <laughs> this will be interesting discussions in the firehouse. <laughs> Once again, a beautiful display of friends and family. Okay. Uh, we're in, after this, uh, uh, we're going to do a police swearing in. Mr. Unger asks that if, if we would all just stick around for fire folks would uh, stick around for the next one. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have item B, presentation by Chief Cordy, um, introducing and swearing in newly hired police officers. Evening, board. Good evening, everybody in attendance. Mike Jordan. Stand here, we're pretty guys. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right, board. Before you tonight, I have two individuals: Mike Mondello, that's going to be on your left. Everyone else is right. Mike joins our department as uh, with nine years of law enforcement experience. Mike's come to us from the city of Woodlawn, where he worked uh, and held the rank of sergeant. Mike went to Roger Bacon in the University of Cincinnati, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Jordan joins our department from Hamilton County Sheriff's Office, where he served as a corrections officer between Hamilton County and the State of Michigan Department of Corrections. Uh, he was a corrections officer of roughly three years. Mike went to high school, college in, in Michigan, and moved to the greater Cincinnati area in 2020. Uh, if I could have you both uh, introduce your family, if you would, please. All right, Mike. I've got quite a few. <laughs> my wife, Carly, my son, Eli, uh, my sister, Michelle, my brother, Matt, my uncle, Dave, my aunt, Sue, my grandma, Betty, oh. <laughs> my mother-in-law, Lynn, my father-in-law, Dave, and then my sister-in-law, um, Jane Marie, but as well as Pete Marie, who I met met through you. Thanks, Megan. I've been mentored uh, for a while. Oh. Uh, great. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Let's stand over here. Let's bring up who's going to be standing on the board. Come on, Eli, we need oh, you. Oh, cute. <laughs> now it's a cute picture. All right. All right, guys, ready? All right, for the sake of it, I'm going to slow down. I know you get a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here. I know. I get it. All right, hi. Hi. State your name. Mike Mondo. All right. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? That I'll uphold, <laughs> that I'll uphold the Constitution of the United States? The Constitution of the United States. Of America. Of America. And the Constitution? And the Constitution of the State of Ohio. You called him Michael Jordan, you know. You said Michael. Uh huh. Just saying. Uh -huh. All right. And <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. And we, if we could just ask, um, we have one more proclamation if, if people can just hang out uh, for another 60 seconds uh, or so. Um, congratulations to those folks. And now, um, do I have a proclamation? Yes, Mr. Mr. Baker has it. Um, okay. So um, this is a proclamation recognizing Diwali and Coring Township, which I believe started yesterday. And is it what, four, day, four days long typically? Is that right? Uh, how about that? It's, uh, I believe, uh, so I teach world history, I believe it stands for lights, right? The new light, right? Outstanding. Thank you so much. So this is a proclamation recognizing Diwali and Coring Township, October 24th, 2022. Hamilton County, Ohio, uh, be it proclaimed by the Township Trustees of Coring Township 
that whereas the Hindu American Foundation and over one billion Hindus worldwide observe the festival of Diwali, the festival of lights, and whereas recognizing the historical significance of Diwali, the U.S. Congress passed a resolution in 2007 to celebrate this day of significance, which has been part of official White House celebrations since 2007, and whereas Diwali renews the commitment to upholding the values of truth, non-harm, charitable giving, and community service, and whereas Diwali is a time to recognize the light in our lives that manifests itself in the form of knowledge, peace, compassion, and well-being, and whereas there's a sizable popula population of Hindus that have made Kohlrein their homes, many of whom originate from Bhutan, Nepal, and India, and whereas Kohlrein wishes to recognize all these with a Hindu American heritage uh, and proudly resolve to celebrate Diwali every year, be it proclaimed, the Kohlrein Township Board of Trustees does hereby recognize October 24th, 2022, Diwali and Kohlrein Township and supports its message of the victory of good over evil which resonates with the American spirit. Uh, this would be, if, if passed, adopted the 25th day of October, 2022. I motion that we would approve the proclamation uh, as read by Mr. Wallert. I second. Any discussion? I think it's a beautiful mantra. If we all lived by this, it would be a better world. And I think we're having the light come mm -hmm. to us right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So we will we will have a quick vote, and if you'd like to, if anybody from you or anyone from your organization would like to say a few words, uh, but we'll call that question to vote. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. I could turn it on. Thank you so much. We are so grateful. We are very thankful to Colorado Township Board, Administration, Police Department, Fire Department, as a whole, the resident of Colorado Township. Uh, Diwali is one of the major festivals that we celebrate that Hindu people celebrate. And uh, after like 10 years of staying in Colin, this board has now this year passed the proclamation. So we are very much thankful to the present administration and present board. Diwali is a festival of light. We celebrate every year, it falls in October, November, according to the Hindu calendar. So we are proud to be the resident of Corden. We are proud to be the resident of Hamilton County <coughs> and a proud citizen of this great country. Thank you. We're proud to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give it to you. Can you want a picture with the group? Can you get okay. Right. I didn't. Do you want to present yeah. Yeah, give it? Why don't we take a picture in the front here and okay. Jeff and while, and while we're doing that, um, if folks are just here for police and fire, you can we, exit we, while we're taking pictures. To stay. But you're welcome to stay. <laughs> Okay, okay.
Crowds have really cleared. <laughs> I don't know if that affects the camera. Um, all right. Um, now we have um, um, a presentation on Township Litter Program by uh, Mr. Wackback. Yes, sir. Thank you, board. So while I'm pulling that up real quick, uh, we thought it would be helpful to provide an update on how our, our litter efforts have gone, specifically looking at our internal staff and our internal employees. I know litter has been a major focus of this board, especially when we think about our goals of uh, clean, green, and prosperous, uh, with clean being the first one that I just said. So uh, just some highlights of what the program actually is. Right now, we have three part-time employees allocated, and all those roles are filled. They all work about 20 hours a week. Some weeks, it's a little less, especially if there's a holiday. And they're one or two-person crews. Um, you know, they're out there, they're cleaning up the Main Street Trail, they're cleaning up our neighborhoods, they're cleaning up Colerain Avenue. So they're trying to find all the different hot spots that we have to make sure that they are being effective in what they are doing. Now, they also are providing some valuable feedback loops to our police department. So if they find a spot where, say, there were 20 tires dumped overnight, they're going to report that to the environmental crimes officer so he can go out and then start investigations. If they're starting to see a lot of dumping in one particular area, They'll pass that along to see if we can't get deer cams and different things like that. And just as a reminder, we're currently paying for this program through the uh, Hamilton County uh, Recycling Incentive Grant, which is based off of the amount of recycling that our community does. So this is what we're doing with those dollars and how we're funding this program. So this is a, a bubble diagram showing where our litter laborers have spent the most amount of time. And I know that might be hard to see when you're looking at the map there, but really, I think when you're looking at it, one of the, the biggest spots where they're at quite a bit is on Galbraith Road. That's where they recognize that there, there tends to be a lot of trash and litter that accumulates. And so I uh, wanted to show this so you all could just kind of see some of the areas where they have been. If you see a dot on the map, that means they've been there multiple times. So, uh, you know, it's probably no major surprise to folks, but there, there are quite a lot of different spots where there's litter in the township. And this is just a highlight of all the different uh, items that they have collected over the uh, year and a half that it's been in existence. So in 2021, the program was actually only one employee. So that's why the numbers are lower. Uh, and you'll see that in 2022, year to date, they've collected nearly 1,800 bags of trash uh, off of our streets. They've collected 700 signs this year. Last year, they had over 1,000 snipe signs that they collected. When it comes to shopping carts, they've collected and returned. 130 in 2021 and 281 in 2022. And in tires, they've really made a big, big dent this year, and that's with 218 this year. And the, the benefit now, and, and part of the reason why you're seeing increases in some of these numbers, we knew that there were a few areas where there were some tires that have been dumped, but they were down in ravines that weren't safe for us to get to. And now that we've got two-man crews, we can actually go down and we can have somebody just being there for a safety standpoint in case one of the guys does fall or get injured. Knock on wood, nothing has happened, and we hope that nothing does happen to our, our litter laborers. So just wanted to sort of summarize and bring forward some recommendations. Recommendation from staff is to continue the program moving forward. I know when we started this, we said we were going to do it as a trial just to see what the numbers looked like and how we did. Um, we're going to continue to seek additional outside grants to cover some of the cost. And really the big thing that we've got to look forward toward is in 2025. When we're doing our long range uh, financial planning, we start to see the resources and the sustainability of using the recycling fund to pay for this drop off a little bit. And so we would have to look, assuming that we're still doing the program in 2025 to a different source to cover these costs. So that is in a nutshell, uh, how our litter program has been doing and where they've been. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have on that. I think it's been a great program and the number of calls that I get at least about litter have dropped dramatically and I can see a difference. 
but it does bring to mind something I sent you last week, and I didn't think to ask you when we spoke the other day. Yeah. So the other, maybe last Thursday, that somebody, and I don't know why people do this, but they dumped a couch on Brem Road just up the hill from the intersection with Sheets Road. I sent you a picture of it, yep. and you were going to see if Hamilton County would pick it up, or you, you might not know if we went well, out. And actually, it. in this case, uh, with that couch, um, Hamilton County, w w it was in, it was so close to the road, we felt it was a danger that we just went ahead and had our crew pick it up without okay. waiting on the county. So Great. And that's and if people wonder where their dollars are going, it's to you know pick up when uh, people decide to dump junk in the roads, and please don't do that. And if you lose something you know, that falls out of your truck, please call, call our police and don't leave a hazard in the middle of the road. Because we're, we're not looking to penalize, we're looking to keep things cleaned up. Right. But if you dump on purpose, then, then we're gonna come get you. So, so thank you for handling that. I didn't get to ask you that yep. uh, earlier. I, I too think it's been a fantastic program. I, I know that uh, um, when this first originated, I went to, I went to Mr. Mills and, and he I, we copied this uh, without apology off of Springfield Township. Mr. Unger made it even better by getting us a free truck. Um, which was helpful um, in, in this. Um, well, just a reminder, um, you know, we're in that season. Uh, I think it's 14 days from today um, where there will be uh, an election, um, and there are a lot of election signs out there. Uh, just a reminder to the candidates to pick them up. Um, and, you know, I, I think all three of us have been there when, you know, you're, I, I get it, you're not picking it up Tuesday night, but, you know, by Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they should be up and out of the way, and I still see some signs from the primary. When was that, May? Uh, I picked up a couple the other day that were uh, May primaries, and I think the, the one of the big tests for a candidate that loses, um, it just a, a character test is if they're out there picking up their, their signs after they lost. Any winner can go pick up their signs, um, and I've been on both ends of it, and, and it's really hard once you get your brains kicked in to go out and pick up the signs after you lost, but I think it's a responsibility. <laughs> I've, I've done that before, too. <laughs> yeah, it's about, it's about the most awful thing you can do. It's a reminder every sign so you pick up. Time I was out till 2 in the morning, and I got them all picked up pretty quick. So, <laughs> so uh, just a reminder for them, the, in the, you know, the program's fantastic, and, and a reminder to the folks at home that, um, look, uh, is, is uh, my grade school teacher used to tell me, um, we're not your mother, we're not here to clean up after you. There needs to be responsibility by citizens too to do the right thing. Um, there's a ton of responsibility by citizens helping out uh, in a number of programs, but just don't do it. I mean, I, I guess I, I, it, I don't understand why people would wanna throw trash in their own home um, and stop it. Thank you. I agree, I agree. Uh, I think the numbers speak for themselves and I hope we continue with the funding we have and put it in our budget if we can't get the funding. I think it's a well-needed program, and I like seeing the clean streets. And I love seeing the green garbage bags every other Saturday on the highway. Love it. I don't love seeing that much garbage that people do feel that we need to clean up after them. All right. Uh, there's no action by the board. It's just a receipt of that report, and uh, that will also be the case with item E with Mr. Weckback with the presentation of traffic calming by Township Administrator Weckback. Yes, so board, if you recall, at a uh, prior meeting, I think this was either in September or the first meeting in October, uh, we discussed the 2023 road plan as well as the five-year road plan. What I committed to do was to have us go out and install speed signs so that we could collect data to see which roads have speeding issues, what that speeding issue looks like, to then come forward and have a conversation with you all around potential issues with a uh, need for traffic calming. And so uh, this report will highlight what we saw. And that way, if we do go out to repave these streets and want to install speed bumps or speed cushions or whatever that is, it makes more sense to do it while we're actually physically repaving said street. So um, did want to highlight real quick that uh, despite installing these, we did have an issue with the machine collecting the proper data on, on Renetta. So we do not have data for that. And uh, we did not collect data on Gila because that connects to Tripoli, and so it was one long street. So this is, this is the chart that just kind of highlights what the speed was, the average speed. So you'll see on Westerly it was 23, on Menominee it was 25, on Havernal it was 20, on Tripoli it was 17, and on Butterwick it was 17. These roads all are 25 mile per hour streets. Again, and I think I've said this in the past, for it to be an average speed of 25, that means you've got some folks going over 25 and some going under 25. Uh, so keep that in mind. 
I also wanted to highlight what the maximum speed was that was recorded on any of these streets because sometimes it's not about the average, but about you know finding a way to prevent people from going extremely fast. Um, out of all these streets, Tripoli had the, the highest number, which was 49 miles per hour. Somebody was driving on that road. Uh, Menominee did have a 37. Westerly, Havernal, and Butterwick were all sub 35. And so with that, wanted to either leave it open to discussion and questions from you all at this point. We do have an agenda item later in the agenda to discuss this more. So if we wanted to wait until then and after resident feedback, uh, we certainly can do that as well. I would say wait until yeah, resident wait. feedback. That's right. and, okay. yeah. and that is the report. All right. Um, we have uh, two folks signed up for citizens address. I'm sorry. There's no more out there. I don't think so, but I just can't. okay. Um, uh, first, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Perano. Welcome, sir. Microphone, Bruce. Uh, at the bottom of the. How about now? Yes, sir. Okay, sorry. Uh, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the elections are coming up and there's bond issues on the, particularly for the school board, for the schools. And as a person who's part of the 48% of the people who pay for all the federal, state, local activities, I'm getting fed up. Uh, the school board wants to have another four point something mill levy and for a uh, school board that the schools are not functioning well. They've actually cooked the books in their uh, submissions to the public on how well they're doing. That uh, they need to look at what they're spending their money on and buildings are not always it. It's teachers and if you can't get the teachers to do what they're doing, you need to find a different way of funding education. Uh, and this also looking at the senior citizen levy, the hubris of the folks putting this on the ballot is, give me all of it or give me nothing. It's not an increase, it's like I'm taking all of it off and you either vote it all in or you get nothing. The same way the zoo when they wanted to sell the elephants 20 years ago. So the point is, public needs to wake up and the folks who own property who rent need to charge back and let the tenants know that their rents are going up because of all these levies and that's pretty much it and I know that uh, you're considering a police levy down the road and I've said this before I believe in police and fire as the most important aspects it should not be hidden as a separate levy because people will vote for it. We need to look at what the entirety of the township needs and then rank it. And as somebody I watched on two or three weeks ago or last month, uh, pickleball, really, I know it's a thing, but if you can fund pickleball, you can fund the police in other words, take it out of the lowest hanging fruit. If that's parks and whatever, that's where you take it. Thank you, and everybody go out and vote. Thank you. And um, our final speaker, uh, there are no others out there, uh, Mr. McVeigh. Thank you, board. Good evening, sir. I'd like to start off uh, commending uh, Mr. Weckbach for such a great start. He's, uh, he's a pleasure to work with. He sets the right tone. Um, I think we're gonna see great things. And Jeff, I appreciate what you're doing. I can, I can sense it uh, in your presentations and how you're, you're dealing with folks. Uh, tonight, I'd like to pick up on a little bit around what Bruce talked about. <clears throat> and it's uh, why we're choosing this period of time when we're at rampant inflation at all times highs to be considering um, taking on more debt uh, in the school district and, and here in the township. 
I spoke to the school board about this uh, the night they passed it. I told them that I wasn't in favor of it then because this is not the right time to do this. <clears throat> and we all know who the people are who are suffering uh, be because of current issues. Um, this bond for the school, which is 175 million over 38 years, will cost uh, a homeowner who has a $230,000 house $410 a year for the next 38 years. This $175 million bond, uh, the total cash outflow over 38 years is $380 million. $200 million is gonna go to investors who don't give a damn about our school district. Importantly, um, it's not like this improves results in our school district. Um, over the last several years, the district has dropped from the bottom 25% of the schools in the state to the bottom 12%. And there's no data that more spending or new schools is going to solve that problem. In fact, we just built three new schools and I was fully engaged in that effort in supporting them. And uh, we were able to save some money because we made them all the same, but unfortunately it didn't improve the results <clears throat> results, reading results, math results for the kids in those schools is uh, not as good as it, what it is in Montford Heights or Coleraine. So this is not the time to do that. People are out of work, okay? The ballot language, if you're onto this stuff, the ballot language says uh, we're just gonna spend $175 million and it doesn't say where they're gonna spend it. They're not obligated to anything other than the fact that you gave them $175 million. Another important part about it is that they have to spend it all in 85%, spend all of it, 85% of it within five years. That's a lot of money to spend in five years. The last time the school district invested in three schools, a little over 70, and their hands were full in doing that, okay? So I would say that now is not the time, and that's what I've told the school board. I also wanna talk a little bit about the fire station that you guys have talked about. Uh, I think that uh, you're rushing when you shouldn't be rushing. Um, they're, they're, I mean, the same issues apply for the township and the, and the fire station as for the school districts. And uh, I wanna share with you some data which I've pulled off the, uh, sub, off the uh, township's website. Uh, you might think, or you might not know this, but when you see a fire trucks out running we all see them. Uh, less than 5% of the time they're putting out a fire. 75% of the time they're chasing along uh, to support an EMT run, okay? And you've seen them there. Uh, sometimes they're outside directing traffic and other times they're just sitting there. And I want you to see some data that we got off the website. This stuff all started way back in 2011, 2012. Someone, I'm not sure who, made a command decision that we were gonna send a fire truck out every time we sent out uh, an EMT. So 70% of the runs that the fire trucks make are in assisting an EMT. Our fire trucks are busy. Some of it's because of the command decision that's been made. We can reduce the runs by simply rethinking decision we've made to send a fire truck out with every EMT. There's no data that I've been able to find that, that, that shows the benefit, save lives, better health for any of our residents because they've done that. We also could save fire time if we rethought our mutual agreements with Springfield Township. We're running over there to give their support. Now, of course, they pay for it, but they don't in my judgment, they don't pay what it costs for us to do it. But there are simple decisions that could be made, okay, that will significantly reduce the run times for our firefighters. And I think given where we are with inflation and a cost of materials maybe twice as high as normal, that you should just slow down, take some time to look at the data that you have in the system around how we're using our equipment. You have the time. There's nothing that says you have to do this right now. 
and I'd be more than willing to sit down with you or the chief, any one of you, to go through some of this so that you would understand it. And the other thing, I've heard something about this too. I mean, we talk, uh, they've said, you know, the firefighters are, are, are living in quarters that aren't, that aren't up to par, and that shouldn't be right. Um, they're, they're in sewage. I have to say, if we have a sewage problem in a firehouse, we don't have to rebuild a firehouse. We dig up the sewage line and replace it to get rid of that problem. You don't have to build a new firehouse to do that. So I just urge you to take the time, you know. This is not the time to ask residents to put out more money for things that, when they're gonna cost much more than they'd cost if you just took some time to slow down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, administrative reports. Uh, looking at department directors, I, I do not see any administrative reports from any of them. So for my report, I just want to, to quickly uh, echo some of the statements made earlier. Elections are important. If, if you are registered to vote, please do so in a few weeks. I know this is the last meeting before uh, election night. So uh, good luck to anybody who has something on the ballot. And then my other report that I want to highlight just real quickly is uh, PWC Give Back Day. So that was this past Saturday. It's one of my favorite days of the year where we have residents, volunteers, all go out into the community and make an impact by providing some much needed support and repairs to some of our homes in our community. Uh, this year, I think was a landmark year. I haven't gotten the final tally yet, but I've been told that we were in excess of 300 volunteers at the event. We had uh, representatives from multiple area high schools. I think three different high schools had folks come uh, to support. We had several churches, we had lots of community uh, groups as well, as well as staff from, from all of our departments. So it was incredible to see, and we kept uh, the walk-in registration line very busy that day. I think we had you know, probably 50 or so walk-ins that day, which was really incredible. So it, uh, it certainly was a great community event, and I wanna give a big uh, shout out and kudos to Will Mueller from our fire department. I know he puts a lot of time, effort, and energy into this. And without this event, I don't know that we'd be making the impact that we would like to every year. So appreciate everything he does for us and, and for the community. And that will conclude my report. Hey, Mr. Weckbeck, I don't know if uh, we do this now or it's not on for new business, but I did want to make a motion. I don't know how this escaped, uh, escaped all of us collectively, but we do have a meeting scheduled for Election Day. Many of us might be political creatures in or a little bit busy that day. Uh, so do I need to make a motion now or... Um, during new business or whatever that we postpone that I don't have my calendar the to the 15th to the 15th yeah I believe you could probably make the motion at any so, point yeah. so so I'm in a motion to in in, in uh, I'm in a motion that the administration change the meeting that's scheduled I keep wanting to say the 11th that must have been in the, from the, November, the 8th yeah. to the 15th um, and do the uh, I motion to change the Township trustee meeting from the 8th to the 15th starting at 6 p.m. with the legal notifications in all websites and everything updated to reflect that so that not only we can participate in voting and working election day, but so that many of you can as well. Is there a second to that? Sarah just indicated to me that zoning commission is actually scheduled for that night. Okay, it is, um, yeah. So uh, we can certainly move to that date and we could ask David if maybe zoning commission can, can find a, a different day of the month. And he's indicating yes. Yeah. Oh, it's the eighth. The eighth is it's the second Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll second it to get it to the floor. So we have um, a motion and a second. So I don't want to. Is there business of the zoning board that's due that day? We, we don't know. But you do have, you do have one item at least that's a, that's a follow up on a zoning change, right? Well, we can cancel the meeting on the eighth. Okay, so you, we could cancel the meeting on the eighth and announce it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to dis. I want to cancel the meeting on the eighth. I don't want to disrupt uh, some company that's got something before. Right, the zoning I, I agree. David's not sure if there is anything right now. We could certainly, I'll withdraw that motion 
Um, but we could certainly do the 22nd, 20. Why don't we? I don't want to be back to back. I don't know. Okay, so why don't we hold this up? Why don't we hold this off till it's a new business? Yeah. yeah. Is All that right. a problem, Sarah? I don't want to be. I don't want to be walking into something. Okay, so we'll just discuss that under new business. Okay. So uh, that does it for administrative reports, trustee reports. Did uh, I saw the chief come back in? Did yeah, he have a was, report? Chief, do you have a report? Um, Watch, come on up. Okay, go ahead. We're back to administration reports. That's what you get for coming back in. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Good evening once again. Uh, just to address a couple of things I heard. So um, I heard that we send a fire truck on every EMT call. That is not the case. We triage the acuity level of the call and we send an ambulance with EMTs when it just requires an ambulance. And we send an ambulance and a paramedic engine when it requires a higher level of care. So an example would be if you fell down and broke your finger, we send an ambulance with a paramedic and an EMT. If you're having a cardiac arrest, for example, your heart stops, we can't just send an ambulance with an EMT and a paramedic. We send an ambulance and a paramedic engine for that higher level of care because in that case, we need somebody to manage an airway. We need somebody to do CPR. We need somebody to start an IV. We need somebody to liaison with the family. We need somebody to grab equipment. And so um, we don't send a fire truck on every EMT call just to clarify that. Um, outside of that, I think I heard something about uh, sewage in the building and just digging up the floor. To reiterate, uh, that fire station was built in 1966, was never intended to be inhabited 24-7, 365 by um, paid firefighters. It was a volunteer fire station intended for volunteer firefighters. Um, outside of that, uh, is there any other questions I could? I, I have a, Go ahead. a question. Um, we have an item coming up here about the five-year plan for, for road repairs and, and traffic calming devices. And I know some time back I had uh, brought that up to Chief Cook. And what is your feeling on, on speed tables or speed cushions as far as, the, do you think there's value in having those? Uh, I think that's a very fair statement and it would be counterintuitive for me to stand up here and say we shouldn't do something that would provide an enhanced level of safety perhaps to a neighborhood. I understand that you have to balance uh, the financial aspect with safety. Um, we also have to understand that there could be a reduced response time. It could be 10 seconds, it could be 20 seconds, it could be a minute or two. And so, you know, for me to stand up here as the fire chief and say, I'm opposed to traffic calming devices, I, I can't say that. I would say that it requires uh, a conversation like we've had, choosing the right path, and then um, moving forward with, our, what I, with whatever that recommendation is. You know, from my perspective, uh, having been a paramedic for 24 years now, um, having taken care of any number of patients, children included. Um, those kinds of incidents don't just go away in your mind the next day. And so if a traffic calming device can prevent things like that, um, sure. So it could be a good idea. Yeah. The, um, some of these streets, and I saw our speed calculations on some of these streets, and I, I know a couple of those are in our road program in the next year or two, and I think that's why this item is on here. And if there's an economical time to install some traffic calming, it would be ideally, you know, when the street's being reconstructed. Right. Um, I tend to favor such things, having a, a very long background in the, in the paving business, and the fact is it does slow traffic down. And for whatever reason, and I don't recall it being that way when I was younger, um, people seem to pay a lot less attention to cars going down the street. They're either preoccupied on their uh, phones or texting or, or whatever, and I just think there's value in, in slowing traffic down. And, and you mentioned your, your many years as a paramedic, it must be terrifying to see a kid or somebody got knocked off a bike or was on the, 
thought they were on the sidewalk and they were on the corner of the street and the cars were going a little fast. And, and uh, my, my question to you was, is there value in, in having them? I don't do paving, but I do do safety. And, and my answer would be yes. Okay. And it would seem to make most sense to me that I'm not doing paving, but doing safety, that installing them at the same time that you're paving Right, and that, that's I was in that industry for for twenty plus years, and and um, I know Cincinnati has them in a lot of places, and it's it's been subject of debate, and we've done some some uh, put out these speed monitors and, and and put together data, but I just think it's we need to slow some of these cars down. It doesn't take an average speed of thirty; it takes five people going forty seven miles an hour a week. And one of them picks off somebody, and, and that's just bad. I know we talked about getting people off of Joseph Road at one point, and that discussion has been going on forever. But you know, we have an issue getting a sidewalk in there, and I'm not suggesting we. That, that's a county road, Joseph is. But in our subdivisions, I don't. And, and the thing is, a lot of the speeders live in these subdivisions, and they they cut through. And uh, boy, I, I got to get home 30 seconds sooner, and and I just think speed tables or speed cushions would slow them down a little bit. And it sounds like, from your point of view, it would add a safety component that, you know, might reduce the incidents back there. You, right. you talk about response time. Well, if there's five less incidents every two years, then then they're worth it to me. Yeah. The important thing is we just measure that calculated risk of of having those put in. If it's 10 seconds, is that a risk that we're, you know we can calculate and say that we can live with that. So I'm, I'm glad you, you find reasons to have them. So thanks. Thank you. Chief, uh, with regard to the, and this is discussion I've had with you a little bit, probably with Chief Mueller um, a bit more. So the, the uh, in the case of an ALS event, we need that we need to have the, the people there responding. Um, we're gonna be wrong sometimes because we're trying to triage on a telephone call, and um, if we're going to be wrong, I, I guess it, it's it's kind of. I think we probably agree on this. I'd better be wrong in overreacting than underreacting when it comes to to somebody's life. I think that would be a fair, very fair statement. And we take a lot of time and effort into building our response plans so that we don't undersend resources, and we also don't oversend resources. Um, you know, the problem with undersending is. It impacts life and property. The problem with oversending resources is it can impact life and property too because now we have everything here, but there's another incident here. So then it prolongs response time to there. So we do our due diligence. We look at national standards and we try to be very careful about um, the decisions that we make when we build out response plans and sending the appropriate resources. It's, it's kind of like a football team. A football team just does, doesn't have 11 quarterbacks on the field. They have an no, there's only line. one Joe Burrow. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they have a quarterback. They have an offensive line. They have a tight end. They have wide receivers. When we're building out our team on the incidents that we respond to, we try to pick the right team to put forth on the field to win the game. And I, I've been very vocal about the fact that uh, these numbers keep climbing and we need to somehow do, uh, um, somehow disrupt our delivery services. And um, uh, to kind of phrase it uh, inelegantly, that ain't it. Um, it, it, and I had this, there's now a computer program that I feel so uncomfortable with that, that makes the decision for you. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with that program, but uh, um, Chief Mueller and I had a long discussion about a computer making that decision and how, ugh, you know, it's... it's uh, another thing to, to, to think about, and we've talked about that as community paramedicine, when we can get out ahead of things and we can reduce those repeat calls, that has an impact as well in terms of um, being available for uh, other incidents. And, and so, you know, it's, it's a holistic approach to emergency services. It's not just as simple as, well, you shouldn't send a, a fire truck on every EMT call because we don't. And the data suggests that community paramedicine does reduce the calls, um, and that's something that we're, that we're working towards next year, um, bringing back in, in some segment. And I've, I've talked to um, uh, uh, Chief Mueller about that in the uh, Hamilton County um, a health department about getting getting hospitals buy-in because um, the way the way that it works and this is a big education for me is that if I'm transported to a hospital and uh, by um, by ambulance and then within 30 days I'm transported for the same the same issue uh, they don't get paid 
Um, so there, there's a, we have a shared common interest with the hospitals in working to, to try to reduce those calls. And I think that there's, I think that there's some area to be made with us partnering with the hospitals and the hospitals paying for the parts of the community paramedicine program. And that's one thing that we're trying to sort out, but you need everybody on the same page. Um, and I would just sum up things with this from my perspective. Uh, the system that we've had in place since 2011, I believe was the day that I heard, one that we've tweaked along the way, um, is a system that works so well that the Ohio Department of Public Safety uh, designated us as the EMS agency of the year mm -hmm. just a few short years ago. And I'm going to validate what you have said. You've been a frequent flyer at my, I've been a frequent flyer for the fire uh, EMTs at my house, and there's never been a fire truck. It's always been an ambulance or, or a paramedic, one truck. I have elderly parents that live with me, so I'm, I'm right there to validate what you've said. Yeah, and, and just to clarify that too, sometimes, you know, we have um, GPS location systems on our vehicles. Mm -hmm. If it so happens it's an ambulance call, but a fire truck is driving down the road, well, guess what? If that fire truck is closer, tag, it's it, <laughs> and it gets there first in two minutes instead of six minutes by virtue of um, automatic vehicle location systems. So sometimes the fire truck does show up when the fire truck shouldn't show up with the ambulance because it's a VLS call, but it was closer via AVL and gets tagged onto the run. Mm -hmm. So there's exceptions to, right. you know, we don't send fire trucks in every VLS call because my question then would be, even if you just fell and, and broke a hip and just needed an ambulance, would you want a fire truck that was close by there in two minutes to help begin to render care? Or would you want to wait six minutes for the ambulance that was coming from the fire station? I think we would probably say, two. I'd want somebody there in two minutes because they were closest. Mm -hmm. So. Any other questions? Nope. Thank you so much Thank for your you hard for work. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, David, do we have any? Yes, there is a um, prospective business that is going to have a visual thing that's going to be reviewed. Why don't you come on up and speak at the. <clears throat> because we can all hear each other in this room, but on television, if you're in a crowd, we can't, they can't hear. All right. So for the November 15th Zoning Commission meeting, a couple items that are on the agenda would be presenting the 2023 meeting calendar to the commission uh, for their uh, uh, approval and setting the calendar out. And then there's an initial concept review for a business that is wanting to open in Coleraine. It, if why we're in executive session, could they do, use what a six or seven? What time does your, your meeting start? According to the township website, they start at six. So we could open our meeting, go into executive session, and then wait to start the actual meeting until zoning commission was completed. That could save Waycross a trip. Did I hear that, Dana? Dana? Um, <laughs> Fine with Mer Dana. She agreed. Yeah. All right, I want to make it more complicated because that day is uh, the 15th. Also, uh, Mr. McAravey has tentatively scheduled the JED meeting. At 5:30, I guess that won't make it more complicated. It's no. Just, so the Jed meeting usually just lasts a couple minutes. Two so. minutes, right? Yep. And the other thing that um, um, somebody um, did mention to me uh, sent, just sent me a text on, you know, it doesn't. It's not written in stone. It has to be on Tuesday. I know that that's kind of yep. in everybody's schedule. Um, certainly, if it would work better Wednesday, I know that. However, Wednesday I've solid waste Hamilton County solid waste at 3 p.m. Um, but um, you know that's. I think if, if I think I think that six to seven. I think if zoning has yeah. a short agenda that yeah. evening, yeah. we could make that work. Okay, so I'm going to reintroduce my motion to change to um, cancel the November eighth. Cancel November eighth and um, reschedule it for November fifteenth uh, uh, at six p.m. Um, and make all uh, necessary notifications to uh, press and interested parties that have expressed uh, expressed an interest in being notified. I'll second the motion. All right. I, we can have discussion, or I think we've had a lot of it. So that all would happen in this room? Yes. And we'd, we'd leave, and then... Yep. Yeah. Okay. That you know, would be something different. We can try it out. Yep. I, I, well, I guess, would it be better to make that to 6 p.m., 5.50, and then we don't overlap? Is that... 7.15 to start the trustee meeting? That's I, I think it's fine if it's okay. 6. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't think it would be the end of the world. All right. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's just be a switch out. Yeah. All right, Mr. Baker, call the question. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Ms. Stronger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. For all of you out there watching then, the trustee meeting uh, scheduled for the 8th has been um, um, canceled uh, due to election day. Uh, everybody go out and vote. And it's been rescheduled for the 15th, also a Tuesday um, at 6 p.m. in, in uh, trustees chambers. And all notifications will be made through media and all interested parties that, according to uh, ORC, have requested to be advised of such instances. Thank you. All right, we move on to trustee reports. I'll go. Well, with Chief just being up here, just to let everybody know, our website has wonderful, um, it's October Fire Safety Month. There's some wonderful tips on there, and I think everybody would enjoy reading all those safety tips, how they can protect their house and family. Um, we also, reminder that Halloween is Monday, hence the orange and black, and we will have trick-or-treaters from 6 to 8, so please, please drive carefully during those hours and all hours. And I think we do have a few uh, slots open for the veterans dinner on the 17th. So feel free to call and get your reservations in. And just, I got the opportunity to go to the Smokies this weekend and the colors were gorgeous. And I hope everybody's enjoying the beauty of mother nature right now. That's it. All right, you need to go? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, just a few things. Uh, a reminder to go out and vote. Um, in Two weeks I keep thinking it's next week but in two weeks um, um, I think this is a pretty I, I see this every election but it seems like it is a pretty consequential elect consequential election uh, there's a lot of um, things on the ballot and it's not just restricted to financial issues there are also issues in, in um, how we want the, the future of our state and, and area to look um, thanks to everybody that participated in give back day um, I had a previous engagement that's been set for like eight months that I could not get out of out of town um, but I appreciate everybody volunteering and, and thank you so much. Um, just a reminder for Halloween to watch out. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's, I've talked about this the last kind of three meetings about, um, um, I'm almost to the point now at the age of 53, I'm almost scared to drive. It's just amazing what's going on out there. Um, I, I witnessed uh, on the way to work the other day, uh, I go down Grand and then turn on Glenway. Someone actually cut in front of me drove up into somebody's yard and knocked their privacy fence down and came within a few feet of knocking into their house because they were going too fast. Um, we read every day about, uh, about pedestrians that are hit um, and some are killed and it's just, it's disgusting. Um, and I know that part of it is um, every, every day when I go down Coleraine Avenue to work, I see at least 15 to 20 people not obeying the crosswalks. I get that. We just have to be a little bit more careful and slowing it down um, is not, I mean, you're saving two minutes. Um, you know, and, and I know that that extra two minutes of sleep at six in the morning might be important, but uh, it's, it's not worth anyone's life. Uh, the last thing is, I, I've, I've talked about this last meeting too, and I thank um, Mr. Weckback, um, uh, the Chief Chiefs uh, 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 of Police and Fire for kind of helping this out. I he have identified a number of cuts the, uh, in the budget, um, and um, we have found um, 292,000 $500 worth of items that, that uh, I've recommended to Mr. Weckback be cut out of the budget um, and um, still kind of digging through that, uh, you know, $48 million budget is kind of a big document because I think it is important uh, and I think Mr. Prano said it best, we're, we're, you know, we're fire police public services. Um, that's, that's what our, our focus is on uh, um, moving forward. So um, we need to provide that and, and I'm of belief with the the, the crime rate as it stands in, in our country, in our state, in our county, um, we need to have more, not less, police on, on, the, on the beat. Um, it's, in addition to the traffic issues, it's scary, the violence that we're seeing on a daily basis throughout our county. Um, you know, when's the last time you picked up a newspaper and saw, I think it was back to back in Westchester shootings, like day, day on day. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And um, I think we need to stay in front of it and I think we need to, uh, to make sure that we have enough police out there to address it because if not it's it's going to spin out of control and to be honest with you the way the the way the uh, courts are going now it's really catch and release uh we you know our police put them in they get let right back out um but we're going to just keep putting them in um until we until we uh solve this crime spike so that's my report um thank you so much uh mr Unger.
Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, I talked about it earlier in the meeting. Thank you for getting the couch issue resolved. I hadn't had a chance to talk to you about it. I think our litter cleanup program has gone very well. Um, I've always made a habit, and, and we have a process, and please call the township if you see something. But if it's after hours and, or the weekend and you need somebody to call, I've always given out my number, 513-404-3057. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that our, our um, trash investigator and Chief Cordy have worked well together, and uh, we've got a lot of these issues resolved before they, it's a lot easier to put out a candle than a forest fire, and, um, and Chief's done a great job of, of chasing these things down and getting them taken care of. I heard earlier mentioned about community paramedicine. There's another thing that you can do if you're a frequent flyer with, with police, and with hopefully not with police, but with fire and ambulances, is a smart 911 system, and I believe that's a way of entering special information unique to your phone number so if, if you had a, a heart patient or something at home and and you know you were at the point where you were calling an ambulance as soon as you called 911 from your phone i guess some of that information would light up on the screen and our personnel would know that so i would encourage our citizens to look into smart 911 and see what um if there's a benefit in having that information right there when you make your emergency call uh, there was another comment about the senior levy and the increase in it, I think that they're advertising it as, is that advertised as a, this won't raise your taxes? Yeah, I thought so, so too. That is was... because five years ago it went up by 30% mm -hmm. is, is why they're not raising it now. I, at that time in my life, from uh, 2005 until 2016, I was a member of the Hamilton County Tax Law Review Commission, and we reviewed these five-year levies as they came up for renewal. Well, having been there for 11 years, I got to see everything twice. And, um, and uh, God rest his soul, and I, th I think he was a great man, but um, when Commissioner Driehaus was elected, Commissioner Portoon uh, mentioned to me that it was time to roll me off of that committee and, and uh, bring in some new members. And the, the person that I was replaced with is my political opposite, and I believe he is still on that commission. But during my 11 years there, nothing went up by more than the rate of inflation. So as soon as I left was when that giant um, increase came to the senior levy. And I just always believe you need to balance the, the needs of, of these, uh, these uh, agencies with the ability of taxpayers to pay for them. And, and you know, a lot of times people will, will pack up and leave our great county and go to outside counties because the taxes are less. But, you know, when they need something, they come back here to Hamilton County because we have all the resources that these things pay for. But with respect to the senior levy, the, the big increase was five years ago, and that's why I think it's a... They're advertising it as um, there's no increase at this time. And I think that was, uh, I addressed the things that were brought up, and I think that's about it. To, to the SMART 911, it's also you can put, um, if you have a code on your garage or you have a dog, it's nice when police come in there to know that there's a dog or a cat. Oh, or great. Have you, or have if, you, you know, there's that? sometimes you cannot get to the door, and they'll smash your door in, and if they have an alternative way to get in, it would save some. I have not signed up for it, but I do know it exists. And I, I give out the sheet for for real estate. I, I probably yeah. I probably ought to, uh, yeah. to everybody ought to consider that and just you know you don't want to give away too much information, but if if you're a on a you think you're making critical emergency calls, it, it always gives our fire a heads up to know what the situation is when they're coming to your place. Thanks for bringing that up, and I believe the genesis of that was the Kyle Plush tragedy, uh, where the young man at um, not Summit Country, Cincinnati Country Day was stuck in their parents' minivan behind the seat and right. folded over yeah. on them. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reforms that I think is a fantastic uh, reform that I think came out of that tragedy. We'll have to put you on local jeopardy. Mm. Uh, actually, uh, we've had the Smart 911 system for a few years before that. Uh, so that I was, was going to tell you, it's a been a thing that they looked at the county and then yeah. the city adopted because that happened within the city limits. The city adopted, okay, yeah, yeah that's right. So. So I'm, I'm only half wrong. So just yeah, as, you're, a, you're as a final, what is the SMART 911 system to your knowledge? It's a knowledge? Hamilton County yeah, system. Yeah, so SMART 911 uh, is part of this whole package through Hamilton County where they uh, actually collect as much data as you're willing to share with them, kind of as Kathy and others were alluding to. So if you have a pacemaker, for example, as soon as you put that data in there and you make a call, that shows up on the dis dispatcher's uh, desktop. So when they're talking to our fire, EMS, police, whomever that is, on the way out to the scene, they're sharing that information with them along the way so that when they get there, they know exactly who's there. You know, if you've got an elderly person at home that has dementia, 
that's an important thing to share as well because they may not know who they are. So when you're knocking on the door saying you're firing police, they may not be willing to come to the door or know what to say or what's going on. Um, we've used it in a lot of different circumstances and it's just a great all around tool. It also is tied into the rave system. So when you sign up for that, if you're giving your cell phone number, let's say there's a power outage in your area, like, uh, happened off of, um, Oh, Forest Valley, not too long ago, we can actually go out and send an emergency alert to everybody within that area to say, Hey, we draw a little polygon and say, Hey, all you folks, uh, power's out. Duke's telling us it's going to be out for six more hours. Uh, please find shelter outside of your area. Uh, traffic accidents are another way that we can push information out. So it's a really powerful tool that lets us do things in, in both directions. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on then to um, new business. Uh, first, we have uh, public safety for a number of items. Yes, and those items will be presented by Police Chief Ed Cordy. Board. <clears throat> All right, I have before you uh, A is the resolution declaring nuisance and ordering abatement. Uh, there's only three properties on this one here, but this resolution allows for the removal of uncontrolled vegetation and or refuge at the following properties. 6620 July Court, 10269 Pottinger Road, 10147 Windswept Lane. Uh, recommend adoption of the resolution. So there, are there any motions with regard to this uh, resolution? I motion that we approve the resolution declaring nuisance and ordering abatement at the three properties detailed by Chief Cordy. I'll second. Any discussion? Nope. None. I'd like to see the list getting smaller. Oh, there you go. Uh, we'll call the vote. Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wallet? Yes. That passes 3-0. Those, um, um, those properties will be abated. Um, item B. Item B and item D actually have the same address. They were, uh, looks like, started at separate times in our process. So let's go with B first. We have resolution declaring a junk motor vehicle. Uh, the following junk motor vehicle was found at 6834 Hillary Drive. It is a 2002 red Ford Explorer with Ohio plates of Henry Boy Young, HBY 5110. <laughs> Recommend adoption of the resolution. I don't see that that's on the resolution. That is, you just read item D into the record. Yeah, I was Sorry. Say he's, yeah. Explains why I have him on there twice in my yeah. paper. I don't think item B has got the right attachment on it. All right, let's go with item D then. Uh, is this the blue Chevy Venture 2001? It is. Um, my, yeah, so item B in our agenda packet is for a 2001 blue Chevy Venture, uh, Ohio plates. CMN 3162. Item B is in boy, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. HBY 5110. Yes. It's what? That's D. D shows as a Red Ford Explorer. Red Ford Explorer. 2002 but, at 6834 Hillary Drive. Right. Is that correct? I have B and a D, both at Hillary on, on my report. And yep. B is on. And so the, the resolution we're asking for you all to adopt is for the 2001 Blue Chevy Venture CMN. 3162 at 6834 Hillary. Okay. Okay, so I would motion that we approve the resolution declaring the junk vehicle located at 6834 Hillary Drive, which is a blue Chevy Venture 2001, as a junk motor vehicle. I'll second. Any discussion? None. None. All right, so make it clear what we're voting on. We're voting on item, item B as in boy, which is actually a blue Chevy Venture. 2001 CMN 3162 Ohio plates on uh, 6834 Hillary Drive. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3 0. So I have these back or out of order now. Is Brampton next? So, a white yes. Dodge Journey on. Okay, we've got uh, the following junk vehicle is found at 2716 Brampton Drive. It is a 2009 white Dodge Journey, Ohio. George Tom Victor, 4147, and recommend adoption of this resolution. I motion that we approve the resolution declaring the vehicle located at 2716 Brampton Drive, which is in fact a white Dodge Journey 2009 as a junk motor vehicle. I second. Any discussion? None. All right, Mr. Baker. Ms. Orich? Yes. Ms. Runger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes. That passes 3-0. Now, uh, the troublemaker in the bunch, item D. B. It was it was Clovercrest B. 
it's showing as clover crest yes. on the link, but when I open the link, it shows as Hillary Drive. Hillary Drive. The other one, a Hillary yeah, Drive. We just have to make the other. But the car is the blue Chevy Venture. No, so so item D is a resolution for a junk motor vehicle at 6834 Hillary Drive, and it Ready. is a 2002 Red Ford Explorer with plates HBY5110. And that's we, how it is in the packet, right? Yes. Yeah. So we would, I had B and D backwards on my. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we right. would. So let's start over here. Item D. Following junk motor vehicle at 6834 Hillary Drive. It is a 2002 Red Ford Explorer, Ohio plates, Henry Boy Young, 5110, and recommend adoption of this resolution. Any motions? I motion that we approve the resolution declaring the junk vehicle at 6834 Hillary Drive, the Red Ford Explorer 2002, as a junk motor vehicle. I second. Discussion? None. I don't know that Officer Boyd likes to free everybody. I know. He, I, <laughs> laugh, I laugh when you say Henry Boyd. <laughs> All right, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. And again, uh, for the record, since there's a little bit of confusion, that's a uh, junk vehicle at 6834 Hillary Drive, uh, 2002 Red Ex Ford Explorer, Ohio HBY 5110. All right, now we go to item E. All right, item E. Uh, the following junk vehicle is found at 3281 Banning Road, and that is a 2006 White Banton trailer. Ohio plates, Sam Young Mary, SYM 60. 89 recommend adoption of the resolution my motion that we approve the resolution declaring the vehicle located at 3281 banning road as a junk vehicle and that is a white bantam trailer a 2006 model the sym 6089 ohio i'll second that any discussion none mr baker Ms. orich yes mr unger Yes. Mr. Waller. Yes, that passes 3-0. Last but not least, item F. All right. Lastly, we have a following is a junk vehicle found at 3437 Holly Glen Court. This is a 2007 blue Nissan Altima, Ohio, Henry Sam X-ray 8021. Henry Sam X-ray HSX 8021. Recommend adoption of this resolution. All right. Any motions? Um, which address is that again, Chief? Yeah. This is going to be 3437 Holly Glen Court. Okay, as soon as it opens here. Yeah. I motion that we approve the resolution declaring the vehicle located at 3437 Holly Glen Court as a junk motor vehicle, and it is a blue Nissan Altima 2007. I'll second. All right, discussion? No. None. All right, Mr. Baker? Ms. Orich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. Thank you very much, Chief, and uh, thanks for helping clean us up one car at a time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Public services. Thank you, Board. The first item tonight from public services is a consideration for you all. If you would like to modify our road plan for 2023 based off the presentation from earlier to include any form of traffic calming. Um, we are busy building out the bid specs right now for the 2023 road program. So it's important that if we're going to be making any changes that we do that now, uh, for your reference, I've listed the, the streets here in the packet. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or if one of you all would like to make a motion, this would be the time to do so. So can we discuss it first and then lead that into a motion or make a motion? I will defer to legal but uh, if we can discuss without having a motion, so. So I, I know that some of these, I know Menominee is coming up on the plan for next year. I guess these all are. And the speeds that are measured there are based on a cratered out street. And anytime you put down new pavement, you're gonna increase the speeds. And, you know, because it's smooth and, and people are driving faster and are not weaving around uh, defects in the pavement, and I'm going to motion that we would install, well, I'll, I'll wait a minute and see if either of the other two trustees have a street in mind that think they think might need uh, speed um, modification or traffic calming. Did you have any streets you were interested yeah, in? Yeah, well, the data that I saw, um, what about Tripoli? Tripoli's on here. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess part of this is, I don't know that I, I feel completely 
at ease about making a recommendation because I don't I don't travel it every day. You're one of those. Um, um, I, clearly, speed is a factor, and I, and, and I think Menominee is. is I've, I've been contacted one. by the yeah. North Brook, Northbrook group about it, and, and there have been, been people have really, spoken on it. They've yeah. been really clear about it. So I'm gonna, if there's. I don't know about Tripoli. What do you know about it? So, so I think, and, and this is one of the fundamental questions with this, right, is, is what is the goal that we're trying to solve? Uh, with Matt, with you saying Tripoli, to me that says maybe the goal is to solve for those really high speeders because Tripoli did have the highest rate of a speeder. It had a speeder at 49 miles per hour. Now, the average speed of the road was 17. So you've kind of got that dichotomy that you really have to weigh is that it seems like not only do a majority of the folks on Tripoli – not speed, but they actually go far under the speed limit. Um, and so that's where I think in terms of this conversation and, and figuring out what it is that you would like to do, figuring out what the goals are of the board. Is it to address those one or two high volume speeders that you get? Is it to address and bring down the overall speed of the, the street? Because you will bring down the overall speed of the street. It's just a matter of what is the end goal uh, that we're trying to solve for. Were these the visible speed signs or the invisible speed signs? These were all invisible. We did not turn them on because we know that that has an effect and that also brings down the, the speed. So. And 90 more percent are going below the speed limit on Butterwick and Tripoli. More likely than not, yes. And it's always those one or two that have to spoil the whole... Sure. Well, that can be on any road. I know, exactly, any road. The, um, so w why don't we stick with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Unger's resolution now, and if we get, um, I mean, look, we're not going to go do the roads in December. So right. from a motion standpoint, uh, something else to keep in mind is the type of devices that you would like to see installed. We did speed cushions on Niagara, which have the carve-outs that allow fire and EMS apparatus to get through at a faster speed. Uh, if you did speed bumps, that would not, I mean, we would have to slow down in order to protect our equipment. Speed tables are like speed bumps, but they're spread out over a, a larger. Are the speed cushions, the, and just for the record, are they still on Niagara? They are, yes. And how are they functioning? What's been the issues with them? Did the snow plows hit them last year? Snow plows have to lift their plow up as they're going over it. So any snow that accumulates on the speed cushion will be there uh, because we can't right. plow. And we push cushion. snow two or three times a year yep. when we get enough snow. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the bigger question there, because those were temporary devices, is whether or not it's gonna lead to some water infiltration and cause some issues in the right. street there. But uh, that was because we didn't do this as part of the actual road program. Right, it is. and our, our, my knowledge of speed table, which is a longer, a much longer speed bump, where you rise up, the whole car fits on it, and then you go back down, sort of like what Cincinnati does on a lot of their streets. It is a, a lot easier and a lot more watertight to install it when the street's being repaved. So I'm going to motion that we would install those on Menominee and you would put that into the bid spec. Did, so did that you say speed tables? Speed cushions? Well, uh, uh, yeah, but not the kind you buy and you staple down. Right. You would construct one based on the, the schematic of mm -hmm. a speed cushion, Yeah. which would be... You know, and if you have low-profile cars, you don't want to damage the cars, so you would have a, an up, a, a length of the speed cushion, you might call it. I call them speed tables, and then you would drop back down. But I would motion that you make that an alternate on the bid for Menominee. Okay, and, and I guess one last question on that motion, too, is number of speed cushions. So what we did at Niagara was we installed three. They were 500 feet apart because that was what data was suggesting. Uh, my recommendation would be if we're going to install traffic calming that we should be looking at doing it throughout the entire street, which, and I don't know the exact length of that street, so that's just something to keep in mind, too, uh, as part of the motion. 500 feet, then, Okay. for the length of the street. Okay. So I'll second that motion. Um, as an alter, so it would be an alternate on the bid to here's the price to pave it, or to, is that street getting new curbs, you know, off the top of your head? Uh, I sure hope so. I think the curbs are in okay. Very I'm just yeah. Yes. Yeah. So an alternate on that bid would be to install a a uh, curb, a raised asphalt, the sh the shape and configuration of a speed cushion, but it would be permanently installed during the the repaving process on, and that's on the 2023 road program. Yes. Do the speed tables involve anything different with the curb? No. If you if you do it when you're paving the road, I'm, I'm the just double checking here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and I will point out, I just got a text from somebody who's familiar with uh, 
the Menominee um, speed things that they were actually on, and you could see your speed. It was visible. Oh, okay. So they, the people were, that, oh. that were speeding knew they were speeding, and um, they're, because of the, the density of the region, you know, a couple of them are near driveways, and they're going to pick up like five miles an hour, and that's going to... And that's going to be anywhere that you yeah. put traffic. Well, and Menominee is a tighter street, and there's a lot of cars parked on the street. Yeah, so that's, I think that is another issue. So I, I think that uh, Mr. Unger's so spot on that. You, you think it's... For Menominee, yeah. since we're going to pay yeah. it anyway. In a in alternate firms, into the yeah. bid to install a speed uh, calming device, uh, the size and dimension of a speed cushion every 500 feet. Yep. So that, that would be... Not Menominee that's being repaved. Yes. And looking at the, the specs here, it's about 1,600 feet that we're looking to repave, so that'd be so about four. Four of them? Yep. That, that'll then put in to put in four of those and then we can kind of look at exactly what that spec is sure. but but please include that and so that's my motion and, and I second it okay. yeah. um, and I'll also add that um, before we uh, see if there are any other comments that really I, I'm not speaking for the other two members but my I'm relying on you and in, in, in the chiefs for um, understanding when there are roads that that need this um, I mean we get citizen feedback and, and and that's that's important too but you know if there's a if there's a street that's wildly um, with a lot of accidents we need to we need to know that data so although we we make the final call on this um, you know any any more information we can get I think is oh, I think, I'd love I'd love to know too yeah. after this is done what well when you put done a, to calm it yeah when you put a device you know we can't have a police officer with a radar or install speed signs every six months when the when people start speeding back up a device such as a comp speed cushion is permanent and it might save us from we might look at it after a year or two and go wow we only had three calls for speeding mm -hmm. as opposed to the 11 we had last year and so yes it is an initial expense but but um it, it's been motioned and seconded i have no other discussion all right mr baker Ms. orge yes mr unger yes mr waller yes thank you for bringing that up so uh, just for what it's worth, I mean, if there were other motions, we can certainly do that here as well for any of the other streets. Um, and to clarify, too, since this is going to be a bit alternate, that'll be something that you all will have to take a second vote on when we actually bring the road program to accept the bid alternate as well. Okay. And there was was there any interest in any of these other streets? Or I guess we I, could... I think we're going to wait for to see if we get additional feedback from police, fire... Um, okay. Just like we... Yeah, citizens, yeah. Last week. Okay. So, well, hearing no other discussion on that item, if you'd like, I can introduce the next, um, which is a resolution adopting a right-of-way utility policy. This is actually the second reading of this policy. It was introduced at the last meeting. And as I mentioned then, and, and I'll reiterate, this is really to ensure that we all, and by we all I mean the township and all the utilities are doing a better job at aligning our, our calendars so that we're all doing projects at the same time as opposed to coming back and ripping up a freshly repaved road. So. Um, I have shared our multi-year plan with various entities, including Duke Energy, Greater Cincinnati Waterworks, and MSD, and asked for their feedback and comments to start that utility coordination process. I've also shared a draft of this policy with them, and I did not receive any changes that they were recommending. So um, with that, I would recommend adoption of the resolution. I motion that we adopt Coring Township Right-of-Way Utility Policy 5.28. I second. Any discussion? I think it's long overdue. This is something that should have been done years ago. Thank you for getting it together. Uh, no comments for me. Mr. And, Baker? Oh, I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. And I was just going to say, this is part, this. so we've been going through this process of trying to get accredited through APWA, and this was one of the things that came out as a recommendation from that. So it's, it is a very valuable process that we're doing there. Thanks, Steve. Mr. Baker? Ms. Orch? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3-0. Um, we go into development, Mr. Miller. I don't know if you know this, Mr. Miller, but I checked the um, standings. It appears both the Eagles and Giants are ahead of the Cowboys. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> um, I don't count that. <laughs> okay. The item before you uh, is a motion uh, to set a public hearing for the demolition of 4519 Pool Road. Uh, just about a year ago, 
There was uh, total near total destruction uh, from a house fire. Uh, very unfortunate, of course, and it has not been uh, able to be uh, repaired. And so this motion was set to public hearing for December the 13th at 7 p.m. And recommendation is for passage. I motion that we would set a public hearing for the demolition of 4519 Pool Road for Tuesday, December 13th, 2022 at 7 p.m. I second. Any discussion? None. None. Mr. Baker? Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes, that passes 3 0. Uh, next, we bounce back to administration, um, and I guess Mr. is Mr. McElravey hand. Uh, we'll yes, try that again. Mr. McElravey. Mr. 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 McElravey yes. uh, handling these items. Yep, all three items. Good evening, board. Good, Good evening. evening. <coughs> the first item under administration is a cleanup item from. Excuse me, a cleanup item from the last meeting. Uh, this is a resolution authorizing the adoption of amended appropriations. Uh, at the prior meeting, the board reduced appropriations for Fund 2906 Sidewalk Waiver Fund to zero, but uh, there has been an expenditure out of that fund. Uh, it was one expenditure for $852.50, so we need to amend appropriations to align um, them with that expense. So the... Uh, Staff recommendation is for adoption of the resolution. I motion that we adopt the resolution authorizing the adoption of amended appropriations for the year 2022, uh, specifically to fund Mr. Michael Reeby has described. I second. Discussion? None. All right, Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes, that passes 3-0, item B. Item B is a resolution uh, requesting approval from the state auditor to create uh, uh, up to two capital project funds and up to two debt service uh, funds in order to manage the accounting associated with the issuance of bonds for two new fire stations. The, uh, the way that the resolution is structured is that it allows for um, up to two of each of these funds um, in order to give us flexibility as we consult with our uh, outside accounting firm and also with the uh, local government services uh, and the state auditor's office to make sure that we set this up in the appropriate manner. Um, um, I expect that where we're going to land is that we'll have one fund for each one, but we wanted to preserve the flexibility to separate out the two houses if need be. Um, so the staff recommendation is adoption of the resolution. I motion that we would adopt the resolution requesting the auditor's approval to create capital project funds and debt service funds. I'll second. Any discussion? Yes, I, I would think it'd probably be better to keep both projects separate so we can track them and I don't think they're exactly the same cost. So I mean, it's both of them aren't going to cost the exact same dollars. So that you're describing that we would have a one for generation drive and one for, for the house on gross back. Potentially. Um, the, but this would allow us to establish two funds up to two. Yes. Okay. That, that's what I want to do. Any other discussion? None. Mr. Baker. Ms. Ulrich. Yes. Mr. Unger. Yes. Mr. Wall. Yes. That passes three zero. And next is item C, which appears to be a discussion on, uh, federal ARPA funds. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, I think the expectation with this item is that this would give the opportunity for the board to discuss uh, the grant that the township received from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan. It is uh, just shy of $7.5 million. It's actually $7,496,967. Uh, and and I think this is on the agenda to provide you the opportunity to uh, discuss potential uses for those funds. And and really the goal from administration is we're in sort of the end phase of developing the budget, the temporary appropriations for next year. And so to the extent that we're looking to utilize ARPA dollars in the following calendar year, it would be beneficial for us to have the direction from you all tonight so that we can start to plan those into budgets. Um, we are not obligated to spend all these dollars until 2026, is that correct? Uh, 24. Need, they need to be obligated by the end of 24 and out the door by the end of 26. Okay. okay. Uh, any discussion? 
Uh, you started it um, with the, the police and fire. Don't give me that look. Um, <laughs> being our, listening from the resident survey, and um, what we've discussed is the safety of Coleraine Township. And if we can appropriate some of these funds and to keep down a bond, uh, lowering a bond issue for our police and fire so it helps our citizens not have to pay so much taxes, that's why I am, and put some of the money in the general fund. So. So one of our citizens came in during citizen comment um, uh, um, last two meetings ago and mentioned uh, they had moved from Green Township and, and talked about their taxes, um, to which point, you know, taxes, uh, it, it's it's odd when, when you have it in your in your mortgage and, and, you know, you just don't get a breakdown on it. And I took a look and compared us to, to you know, the same value of house in Green Township, uh, and my gosh, the same value of house in Indiana, um, and the taxes are so much significantly different um, uh, that it's it's kind of scary. So I, you know, my my belief and hope is that every every dime of that money that we could put towards deferring any kind of any kind of tax levies would be significant and important. Um, uh, you know, especially given you know given what's going on economically and the idea that uh, um, I, I think that, that that we're heading towards. A way of reimagining how we're how we're going to deliver these um, deliverables from police, fire, and and, and and public works, and you know that needs to be our focus, and we need to focus on reducing reducing taxes, um, and and that would be my suggestion. Although seven point five million dollars is a lot of money, it could get split up in several different ways, and and you know I'm always open to any kind of ideas and suggestions, but I I don't want to go to the voters with an outsized levy. Mm -hmm. to, to clarify, in case any of our friends from the federal government are watching, uh, these dollars cannot be used to to reduce existing taxes. What we are discussing is right. using the for dollars as revenue bond. replacement right. so that when we do have a need for tax increases in the future, it is not as significant. Right. And you told me that if the feds had a problem with that, they could come get you. Oh. Well, they can find <laughs> me, I guess, if nothing else. So. No, yeah, that, that was the point I was trying to make uh, so inartistically. Um, is is you know I don't want to go to I don't want to go to taxpayers with a big number. Um, I mean we're already paying a big number. So uh, the discussion with um, I had a discussion with Chief Cordy some time back, and he has uh, told me that what are we in year eight of a levy that passed in 2012? That was the last five years. 2014. 2014. So. And um, you had indicated there would be a need for a levy next year. And I, at the time that we discussed it, I said, that's fine. You have to pay people. I get that. Um, the, uh, it'd be nice to take some of this and, and use that to offset th that levy to lower the cost of it. I would still d drop back to my position that, that one-time funds can, can do that. But but we're setting up the, what's this, 2023, we, we would run that levy. By 2028, when that f levy expired, it would have to be dramatically higher because we'd be using one-time money to offset this where that one-time money's not gonna come rolling in, in in 2028. And if there's $7.5 million, and it sounds like we all three have a, have an idea for a third of it, I would, I would say, um, one thing you can do with one-time money, and you know the firehouse thing has happened, and, and we voted on that and, and settled it, and we're moving forward. I would suggest taking a third of that and, and putting it into our road program. We are 10 to 15 years behind on some of these streets, and if we could go ahead and what do we have? 1.9 million in the budget, something in there for the streets yes, next year. Yep. If we could, then that's for the. And I have no. I have no say over what streets are getting done. That's something our public works comes up with. If we could take the 2023 and the 2024 program and do them both in 23, that would be the, the first step in getting some of our, our streets upgraded, and some of them are in pretty bad condition. And that's a great economic development. When you can improve a whole street, it, it you know it makes the houses more marketable. Nobody wants to you know, live on a street that's all cratered out and, and, you know, we've got some pretty serious needs there. So, so my idea would be, you know, let's put a third of it in our most basic function before, you know, when the trustee form of government was created in Ohio was to maintain a system of roads 
And that was the first thing, because at the time there was a county sheriff that took care of everything else, and I would like to throw a third of it into the road program. And I know when I discussed this with you, you were concerned that would, would a vendor be able to get that extra work done in one season? Well, if our program was a little bit bigger, I, I'm telling you, we would get moved to the top of the list. It's, we're running a small program, and the, those vendors will take on the Cincinnati's and the, the other places that are spending a little more money first and, and save the smaller budget places for us. So my recommendation would be to put a third of it in the, um, in the uh, road program. It's a one-time pot of money, and let's do something with it that, that would impact a lot of neighborhoods that are in desperate need of street repairs. And not, you know, the, I don't know anybody that lives on those, I don't have any relatives that live on those streets. You've picked out the streets, your team at Public Works has. I would just like to do the 24 and 23 road program in 23 and do them both, and then see where we're at after that. All right, so we've heard from all three trustees um, with some differing ideas. What's your next? What's the next? So my goal would be to get some form of consensus from the majority of the board. So, um, you know, in terms of proposals and what we can do with the dollars, there are certainly some needs in fire and police. There are needs in roads. These are all valid uh, areas where we could look to put dollars. Um, you know, one strategy is to, again, and this is another one to throw out there, is to try to get dollars into the general fund, and then you don't have to make a decision today. You can make a decision at a later time. Um, but my goal would be to try to get some consensus from you also. I don't know to what extent at this point in time the goal of the board is to maybe put all of it into uh, police and fire is the goal to put a piece of it into roads is the goal to do all three things that have kind of been said or even a fourth thing including the general fund and so I, I guess I'm just looking for more feedback from you all as a group e e well and this is the first time the three of us have had a chance to discuss it as I often mentioned we don't get to talk to each other outside yes. of meetings and exactly I don't, yes. I don't know if you figured I might bring something forward with the streets or not but I mean we need to get going on our street program it's our most basic historical core function here and and Jeff can you tell the public we have three revenues that generate money for our street program it's the motor vehicle tax. Yeah, so there's gas tax so when you pay at the pump there is the motor vehicle license tax which there are a few of those that you pay when you re-register your car every year and then there's a, a voted le not a voted levy there is an inside millage property tax levy that is dedicated to roads which is double our general fund inside and, millage. and it comes up about a million nine a year right uh, approximately on, two million dollars yep. and we have and all that appropriated 115 miles of streets with going with that that in on the program of renewing our streets every 30 years if we wanted to renew our streets every 30 years we'd have to spend about four million dollars a year so we're, we're behind regardless when it comes right, to that's that what goal when we were talking about the one-time money being behind with yep. in 28 with the levies it's going to be the same thing with the road mm -hmm. well the, the roads are, are more of a one-time thing we would just advance our program so we're doing them every 29 years instead of every 30 but to the people that live on those streets that that's huge that before I got elected here, the street that I lived on w was redone the year before I ran for, for trustee, and it hadn't been touched since the mid-'80s, and it was in pretty bad shape. And, and um, you know, I think everybody that lives here, and th that's what they see. The people see the streets, and they see the police and fire. I, I'm just suggesting that maybe, you know, we each have an idea, and we can support each other's ideas. My third of the idea is let's put some in roads and and you know maybe the idea is use some of this to offset the the upcoming police levy and and maybe we use two-thirds of it to offset the police levy and, and a third of it to get a little ahead on our on our road program that way we're all three you know working together towards a, a common thing and supporting each other and that, that that's my idea so. and and for what it's worth and we haven't spent time talking about this as a group but uh, one thing that is on my mind that I would really appreciate us putting some dollars aside for is some capital in the fire department. We've got several fire apparatus engines that are well beyond their useful life and are, are starting to become a risk for us long term. And so being able to have dollars set aside to replace one of those engines would go a long way toward helping the needs of that department. And also with the police and fire, we have how many new building sites coming in? How, how many new building orders do we have in the next how many years? 
What do you mean by like building? 400. We have uh, the different developments that we have. Oh, yeah. We, we do have a number of developments. Right. So we're going to need more point. police and fire for more neighborhoods and more houses. Yeah. Several hundred well, units are coming right. online. We need firehouses to right. That's serve what, that. Well, I'm just reiterating why we would need more firehouses from the previous discussion. So something you mentioned before, you said that we could um, move that uh, somehow into the general fund. Yeah, so if we wanted to take the auspices of uh, revenue replacement and just offset existing costs in the general fund, then with the ARPA funds, uh, then those dollars in theory would be sitting in the general fund for future use unallocated. We did a third, a third, a third fire police and general fund. In the general fund, if we had some rows we could do, we could use that money from the general fund. Well, yeah, I, I kind of feel like we're slicing with a very dull knife yeah. here. I mean, well, we here's two and a half, here's two and, 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 I and I, there's yeah. three of us, and there'd right. be three different ideas. The thing about starting the 2024 and 2023 street improvement program at the same time is now would be the time to do that because you want to bid those projects. Right. Historically, we bid them in January, which is during the off season. You don't want to go out and find paving bids in July when yeah. the, your price is going to be a lot higher in the, in the off season, which is what the townships historically done. That's when you go out and get prices for, for roads, and that way the vendors can plan and and you know make sure they don't overbook themselves. Because if you if, when I was selling asphalt for all those years, I I pretty much had us booked out by the end of April yep. for for years. And you know people call in August, and of course the price is going to be higher. We're busy as anything, and we don't have time to get to you. So if we were going to do something with the roads, I would you know we need to get that. And we can. Well, I'm, gra I'm glad we're having this discussion, but maybe on the November 15th agenda, we put something on there as a result of this discussion so we can, if these guys want to support me on that, that's fine. And if they don't, that's fine too. But maybe we make that decision by November 15th so that we can put it out to bid, uh, you know, over the winter. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, part of the reason that I'm asking for direction is in terms of finalizing the budget for our formal budget presentation of the budget book, November 15th. The more changes that we make at the November 15th meeting, the harder and more time consuming it is for staff to get that ready, especially now that we're losing that week between the 8th and, and December 13th uh, by moving the meeting back. The other thing that's difficult too, and, and the, the road question is a very valid question because after this meeting, we're gonna be tasking our public services department with developing those road specs. And so um, if we are looking to add more streets in the next year, uh, they'll, they'll need the time in order to get that ready so we can sure. go out to bid. Sure, so it gets out to bid on so time. That that may seem why I'm pushing a little more than in To make a decision. To, to get at least more feedback from you all about, you know, where where we think we would like to go um, with these dollars. Is there some increase we could make on, in the road budget that would, you know, that way we could all three support what each other's thinking? Because I want to, it's a one-time capital thing and people will come down the road and say what did you do with that money i can say well we we picked up an extra 11 streets that year you know, but beyond our, our normal program sure I, I think what you're getting at is an important part of this entire arpa fund um and to steal the dave ramsey quote um if you listen to him um i want to spend it with uh intentionally spend it so that we don't wake up and uh, what do we get for the seven and a half million um, yeah, I just am tied to this idea of, of, you know, what a, what a, um, what a potential police levy would look like in, in just the, uh, the tax burden we're asking our citizens to, to bear. And in addition, if, you know, we had somebody speak on a couple other levies, um, what that would add to it as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that. I don't know there's a right or wrong answer with it, I, I guess. Um, I, I, just, just to be kind of, boom, how are we going to spend seven and a half million? Um, I, I just think that, that I'm, I'm more deliberate on that um, than deciding now. Now, if, if Mr. Unger wants to have motion a certain amount, um, and we could decide on if he well, wants to motion. do that on the 15th, but I, he sounds like he needs to right. an answer quicker. Well, and, and if you even want to do that tonight, we can motion X amount, and um, um, and that leaves Y, I guess. I, I, you know, I, 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 I guess I'm not prepared to give a, a 
I think it needs more more discussion between the three of us yep. to come up with all right x amount here y amount here z amount here so so here are a few things that are being contemplated in the 2023 budget and and a few others and this is in theory where some of these dollars would go toward either offsetting long-term levy costs or other operations so one of the items that's contemplated in the budget is uh, increasing headcount in the police department to match what the staffing study recommended from last year, which would be uh, taking our impact unit from five officers to 10. So that would be one uh, significant dollar amount where these dollars would be spent. Um, we have needs in the fire department that I mentioned in terms of capital. There are also some other needs that, that we've been evaluating in terms of our delivery model and you know is it a full-time department a full-time part-time department where does the community paramedicine uh, play into that whole thing especially with the uncertainty around whether or not you will be able to get the hospitals to pay um, roads are an important factor and then you know certainly any dollars that you wanted to set aside for development or redevelopment or other things to consider as well um, so those are just some items to, to I guess some fat to chew on as we kind of contemplate things moving forward. You know, I'm happy to continue to, to talk with you all offline and I can bring forward a recommendation at, on the 15th that is part of the budget. It's just, it, it's going to, when we do make this move, whatever this move is in next year, um, there's going to be a, a sizable amount of work that finance is going to have to do to make this happen, uh, to, to meet the, the needs of the revenue replacement under the ARPA funds. Um, and there will be lots of additional audits that they'll have uh, related to all this. That's why I, I totally understand what you all are saying. And, and I think the discussion is important. And the more discussion, the better for me. So would you would you consider because he's going to present a budget, what he's still going to do is present a budget November 15th. If we took the 1.9 million, which we're falling behind every year, because we're not, as he said, we're not spending enough on the roads and we and we took 1.9 million out of that so we could do the next year's program and then if you would support that now and then that would give the public works department a chance to say hey great here's what we could do with that money in in um in 23 because we could do 23 and 24 together to be some economy of scale because we're putting more streets in the program it might lower our unit cost and then and then you know you could take it back out on the 15th but he's just looking for a number to plug in for what i want to do or what we want to do and i, I want to i want to do something we can all three support i mean if you want to offset some of this levy i i'm with you i i'm not so much for using one-time money because it's going to cause a, a big spike in, in 2028 which isn't that far off and and um but i i would i guess i have to motion to do that but would, would you consider adding something to the road budget. Well, I, I think that's what I that's what I was getting at before, um, but I got the notion from Mr. Weckback that we need to have a full plan right now of 7.496. The other option is that we can, I mean, we don't necessarily even have to spend any of it next year. We can wait until 2024 and we can spend a lot more time figuring out what we want to do. I think the, the, the big trick, and it was maybe alluded to by someone earlier, is if we have a need for a police levy in 2023 is figuring out what that levy would look like and how we use these dollars is going to impact the amount of money we may be requesting for a five-year levy. Well, what if you put five and a half of it in the police to offset some of the increase in the police levy and put two more of it and put two of it in the road program just to see how it presents on November 15th because that would give the public works, hey, this might exist. Here's what we can get done if you'll Help us out with this, and then you've got then you've got five and a half million dollars to offset the increase for the police levy, and, and, and two for the fire. You don't and two million in, in the road for fire. No, the, uh, he's suggesting the extra five and a half million would be kind of sitting there in advance till we figure out what to do with it. Is that what you're suggesting? Sure, and and if, if you'll support me on increasing the road projects next year, I'll support whatever it is. Or uh, this is politics, uh, and this is the same yeah. argument we've right. been having for a hundred years. Well, right but. now, Mr. McRaven, we are earning four percent on this money, correct? The new investments that we are uh, making are coming in around four percent. Yes, which means we're losing five percent. Because of, inflation. <laughs> because of inflation. Oh well, but we're still making some money on this money as we sit on it right now. Correct? Two sides of the same coin. Right. We we have got to 
do, do something about our, our subdivisions and the streets that so many of our citizens live on. And if we could get a year ahead of that, so we, you know, and if, if you'll support that and, and it, we get to see what it looks like because he wants to bring us something on November 15th and you can say, hey, I don't like what Public Works has come up with, then you've probably got the votes to knock it back down. Well, and, and that's what I suggested before. If you want to make a motion. I would make, well, please help me with this. I would motion that we um, increase the 2023, you, you mentioned when I talked to you the other day, it was about a million nine, mm -hmm. that we would increase the, the fund for capital projects, which is roads. It's not sidewalks or anything else, it's, it's roads. That we would increase that budget item by $2 million for one year only so that we could do the 23 and 24 road program all in 23. So I, my motion is that we uh, allocate $2 million of that in addition to the 1.9 that's already in that fund for next year. And I'll second that for just to, to have the discussion. Um, I do want to point out that I, you know, I think that this this is a good problem to have, as Mr. Baker would say, that where we're going to spend this. And I, I, I get it, what, what Mr. Unger is saying about the roads. Um, I, to me, um, I, I think that we're facing an unprecedented amount of criminal activity throughout the county, the state, and the country. And I just think that um, that we need to have we need to have more police. When we talk about uh, more impact units, we got to have those. And uh, we got to have um, the, the community paramedicine to, or, in order to change the model, to disrupt the model. If, in order to get that done, um, you know, I need to, to support some road stuff, then if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Um, but to me, um, and that's fine because we can have thanks. We can have different goals in mind, and, and you know, right. And I'll support. I mean, that way we're all three working together, supporting something in common. Yeah, I mean, I, in 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 a perfect world, I'd you know, I'd like to to dump all of it into into reducing reducing a potential levy, but um, I, you know, we do have streets that need it too. So. Um, um, I, I will support that as part of an overall solution, um, uh, and you can bring that forward. The rest of it you don't need right right away, right? Is it? I mean, when it comes to the police levy, we will need to know if we're putting dollars into that. We can fund. start working that over the next thirty days. Is that and and figuring out the the dollar figure? Um, we could probably figure that out over the next thirty days. Yes, what what the potential split would be between police and fire? Yes. Okay. And the capital needs for fire, the the the, the impact units for police, and in uh, community paramedicine. Yeah, I believe a million dollars is a a very good number when it comes to the capital needs for fire. The the other items are flexible. Support me so. on this, and then I'm with you. Chief, are you good with that back there? <laughs> Both you chiefs. Okay. Yeah, and so and, and this is something that we we've, we've talked about with everyone internally and and we all are on, on a similar page that, you know, finding ways to get dollars into fire apparatus is critically important for us and finding ways to help with our police needs in terms of the long-term cost is something we think is cr critically important. And, and I will point out there is there is additional support and help on the horizon with the TIFs that come in. You don't want to you, know, you don't want to spend those before they come in, but obviously um, that that's a game changer too, an $18 million game, cha game changer over approximately 20, 25 years. So um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and 400 more housing units and more property taxes, that's going to help out to also when you're talking about 2028. You're talking about TIF money coming in. Right, right. More right. tax money coming in. So, and, and all the stuff that Mr. Miller's going to bring in that's going to bring yeah. in. So this doesn't go into their operating budget. This goes into the street program that goes out the bid. Correct. So it'll change it from 1.9 to 3.9 million. So we're adding 2 million to it. Yep. That I don't have anything else to say. All right, Mr. Baker, call the vote. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Thank you, board. I know that was a, a good conversation, and it does provide me with clear direction on, on what to bring you all in the budget for uh, coming up. So I appreciate that. All right, and we're going to go from complicated to more complicated with old business. Yes, and so old business tonight, uh, this is an item we've been talking about. I'm going to ask Mr. Miller to come to the, the dais for us. Um, this is the resolution establishing the rental registration. Uh, <laughs> 
my recommendation tonight is to not necessarily take any action tonight, but to again continue the conversation and provide us with clear direction on modifications you would like to see to the resolution. Uh, I know since we last met, David and his team has actually met with Boardman Township, which I believe is the only other township in the state to have adopted a rental registration. And with that, I'll turn it over to David to kind of introduce the findings. Thank you, Jeff. So what I have handed you is uh, just a, a simple FAQ that is based on our uh, meeting with the uh, zoning department from Boardman Township. And they have, uh, they, they passed their rental registration program in 2014 and it was uh, litigated and went through the court system in 2017. The seventh district court of appeals upheld the law and then the Ohio Supreme Court denied uh, the appeal and jurisdiction and allowed the law to go into effect. Okay, so uh, what I, I thought just kind of a high level for you, I put some numbers down here, some key numbers. Boardman says the program has approximately 1,500 rental units that are registered. Uh, you'll see just in, in about 90% of those that they mail out uh, do register. So that's a, uh, they're, they're very pleased with that level of participation. Uh, when you compare Boardman to Colerain Township, in, uh, so the Hamilton County Auditor uh, publishes their voluntary list of rental registrations on a quarterly basis. So what we have here is April, June, and October. We're at 2166 in Colerain Township, 2141 in June, and then October, uh, 2170. Uh, those are just the voluntary registrations. Uh, we believe it'll be at least twice that for yes. Colerain Township. Uh, as far as the fees go, uh, Boardman charges $40 per individual unit, up to six units, and then when you get to seven units in a, on a parcel, then it's a $150 charge, and then $15 per unit. Uh, ours right now, the recommendation in the draft is 50 and, and 150, so we, we're going from 40 to the 50. Uh, I think there has been uh, discussions over raising that to either 100 or 150 each, uh, given the, the just the sheer number that we're going to have to manage. Uh, Boardman, uh, this was part of your questioning from the last meeting uh, of waiving the first year or charge the first year and waive subsequent years for uh, no, no problem properties. Uh, they had a, a very um, a, a confident opinion that you should not waive any years because non-payment non sends a signal that you're not serious about your program. And so uh, it, it's a nominal fee, and, and so they felt like uh, it was uh, worth being charged uh, every year. Uh, on the back side, their revenue, they are currently uh, getting approximately $160,000 per year uh, from their program on their registrations. The uh, enforcement, they said that the, the fines that they assess for non-registrants is nominal because they uh, are capped at a $25 penalty. So I'm not... Uh, we, we're not sure why that's so low. They made reference to their law director, uh, whether we could, could change that uh, or not. Uh, Sarah, can you give us that right now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, the enforcement uh, is something I think that we ought to continue to pursue. Uh, challenges in their program. They said that it does require substantial amount of resources to effectively administer it. Uh, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, close close to 5,000 uh, units in Colerain Township, uh, just the sheer number is going to be uh, a lot of work for for somebody. 
clearly, I think from the beginning, we are establishing the fact that the fees that are charged would cover the cost to administer it. And that's the plan. And the, the fees would go into a fund and the cost would come out of that fund. So that uh, hopefully would pay for itself with that ultimate goal of raising the property values and eliminating the problem properties that uh, sometimes accompany rental properties. Um, one other note that I uh, made here on the, the, their challenges, the site inspections, uh, they initially had written those in to their program and they, they literally wanted to do an interior and exterior inspection and they said just again the sheer volume and the, the man hours that it would take they totally abandoned that and they only do external uh, inspections at this point and any interior inspections are done by request only and that would be uh, requested by the tenant generally um, major issue they said strange enough that they just see over and over again is just mold. So they, they've asked for uh, assistance and their inspectors go in and are able to help uh, secure those kinds of problems. Uh, then recommendations, uh, in the last section there, they, the, the first thing they said, you gotta have an elevator speech ready. There's gonna be a lot of questions. Again, given the sheer number that we have in Colerain, uh, there's going to be uh, owners and, and tenants alike, I would guess, who are going to have questions about this and why are we doing it, then uh, I think we can uh, all get together, come up with a, you know, a quick elevator speech of why this is important to the township and w why it's a positive thing for not only the tenants, but I think the uh, property owners as well. So. Uh, I think that's a uh, that's that's not hard to come up with, but it, it's something that's very important. Uh, they said you should start off strong with a registration requirement and fees for everyone. They like the idea of a the, a landlord university. They ha have instituted that. It's been very helpful, and they they said that it provides information not only on the expectations for the property owners, but uh, also for tenants to understand what their rights are. A um, Couple more points here. Uh, um, it was questioned, I, I think by Mr. Waller last meeting, whether the, the registered uh, and or the problem properties would be listed publicly. And they, they really liked that idea a lot. And so Matt, you got a- Every uh, once in a while. You got an extra point there, <laughs> so. Uh, that it wouldn't seem like it'd be that hard to do, and so that would be helpful. Uh, they they made a comment about land contracts need to be recorded because some people try to avoid the registration that way. Um, I think that's probably all for uh, for mentioning. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have any. And, and I think that there are three really big policy questions, and this is where we really want the direction from you all on for a final draft that we can bring to the next meeting. And that is, do we implement the fees day one? What is the fee number? And the final one being um, implementation date. So something that Boardman pointed out to us is that just because you passed the resolution, uh, it's saying you're gonna implement it you know, a month later, is probably not feasible. So would a, a, a good implementation date be say June 1st of next year to give us time to make sure we get everything in line? So those are three policy questions that we're really seeking a lot of direct direction from all of you on. What did Boardman suggest for a time implementation? Boardman took a year. A year. So they, they passed their, well, and this is after they got through all their legal things. It, it was finally uh, ratified and all set to go the first of 2018, and they did not officially start it until 2019. Okay. And th they use that time t as, you know, just public information, just going out to uh, all of, and, and gathering their data. They actually hired a, uh, a department out of a local university, and uh, they used 
GIS data and all kinds of sources and, and put a list together and then uh, de developed it from that mailing list. So it, it took them a while. So there's a couple things going on here um, that I, so a lot of times people, well, why government's so slow? I mean, we need to get this right because if we swing and miss, uh, we don't get a second swing, uh, I, I think. And, that, and that's why I think that this, uh, uh, this memo is, is so valuable in that. Um, I, 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 the more I think about it, the more I'm, I'm tied to having um, uh, a central database where people can understand that their landlords are registered and that, um, uh, and, and it signifies that, that they're going to kind of play by the rules. Um, the, um, uh, we know no matter what happens election day, we're going to have a new auditor in the county. Um, I've talked briefly, there are two candidates, I'm not going to name them, to, but there, I talked briefly with one of the candidates and uh, at a bit more length with the other candidate to indicate that, hey, um, I, I bet we're not the only ones that aren't satisfied with the way this is being done down at the auditor's office um, with, with recording um, rental registrations and things like that. So uh, I think the election might bring an opportunity um, to, to push this further and see what the county has got to say with it too, uh, say about it too. So, um, and, and but by the way, both candidates were receptive. Um, the one I just spoke to briefly, but the other one um, quite a bit, and, and they seemed receptive to it. Um, and, and I just love the idea that we're taking a holistic approach to this to solve this this issue, and um, you know, um, including the the landlords is is part of the solution uh, in solving these issues. Um, that you know, there's the saying that that a high tide raises all boats, and I think that's what we're trying to do with this. Um, as far as the three questions Mr. Weckback asked, and, and you know, I, I was quite um, um, taken back by Mr. Uh, Unger's uh, let's have the first year free, because I thought it would bring more registrations. Um, Boardman has a little different view on that. I, I think probably you do need to hit day one with the fee. Uh, I think how much the fee, um, uh, it should be in, in, in a negligible amount, um, um, you know, 50, 40, 70 bucks in, in that kind of range. Um, in the implementation date, I think that it needs to, uh, June 1st is probably a good idea because it needs to have, it can't have a rolling start, it needs to have a strong start, uh, and it needs to be a successful start. Um, and, and, and I think it's gonna take um, really all hands to kind of figure this out. now. Despite the complexities of this, I think that the the end product on something like this is going to be is going to be a fantastic uh, um, development for the township. I think it's going to be a great asset to have this, um, but we have to stay on top of it. And uh, and, and I look forward to, to to sharing some of these ideas offline with Mr. Weckback. And um, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm happy about all this. And thank you. You guys have done such a, a, a a great deal of work on this that I'm, I'm just really pleased and um, I, I would think that Boardman is probably a lot more complicated than Coleraine, uh, Youngstown, um, even though they have less rentals. Now the only thing I understand that's different about uh, um, us versus Boardman is that they don't have any of the big actors and that's going to be when the when the metal meets the road when we have big actors that have 1500 units are, are they going to want to um, are they going to want to play ball? And it feel uh, it, the fact that Seventh District Court of Appeals said we're fine with this makes me feel a whole heck of a lot better. Um, and their compliance numbers are fantastic, ninety percent. I mean, you know, I, when Mr. Unger said twenty five percent last week, I'm like, oh, that'd be great. I mean, that's I, I couldn't imagine that in a million years. And, and they've got it so tightened up that they're getting that ninety percent. So I will allow my fellow trustees to kind of wax poetic about. Uh, rental registration now that I've completed. Um, well, and it says right here in the program analysis that Colerain, about half of ours, are registered. <clears throat> I get, um, just like the other trustees, I get calls too, and I'll, I'll give you a great example of one. We had a, a police run to one of our neighborhoods last week, and one of the neighbors called and said, hey, what is going on down the street? And when she told me the address, I looked up the address, and it was listed as a owner-occupied house which provides a there's an owner occupancy credit and anybody can look up their house on the auditor's site and this house is or this property is getting a $129 a year owner occupancy credit 
when clearly the owner does not occupy that house because it's listed as an LLC and they had not filed. And I've, you know, we, we talk about tax levies and that, and I've often asked the question, are we getting 100% collection on our levies? And we are not because there's just a number of people that don't want to play by the rules or when, when you have a rental property or if you have a question about a property, look it up. It says very clearly on the summary page if somebody's taking the owner occupancy credit. If you look up my house, it shows I get that credit. I think it's about $180 a year, but that's because I live in the house. I've never gone to revision or anything. I pay the taxes that are levied just like anybody else. But this particular property, and this is not an indictment of renters. My kids live out of town and they rent too, and hopefully you're watching. But 99% but, um, of people are good, just like 99% of homeowners you know, don't give us any trouble. It's just. What brings us to the forefront is, is we just have a problem with some absentee landlords that don't take care of their, their property. And, and I think what we're trying to do here is just sort of get it under control so we have somebody that we can call and, and hopefully make corrections. And we're not looking to be punitive. We're, we're looking to be a, a better place to live where properties are maintained. And if you're going to have as part of your investment portfolio rental properties, you just need to maintain them and and you know it's it's a I don't so much have any problem with the program I guess we would need to decide when it would start and, and what the fee would be but there's a reason to have it and it's because we just have like the example I just gave where we've got tenants living in a house that we think the owner lives there and the owner obviously doesn't care enough to file properly and um, and we're making a police run out there so we just need to get some of these absentee landlords under control and I, I believe this statistic, I think when I first got here, we ran the list of owner occupancies against registered voters. And I want to say there were 630 some where it just popped right up that these people obviously don't live in these houses that they're claiming to the credit. When you take 600 people times $129, what is that, $972,000, $73,000 in revenue that the rest of us are subsidizing because those people choose not to pay it. So. Um, if everybody pay the taxes that they owed and, and file things correctly, then the need for these levies wouldn't be so great. But I just would contend we're, we're never going to have 100% collection on the taxes levied because some people don't want to play by the rules on it. And I've always paid mine, and I'm sure Matt and Kathy have always paid theirs. I'm 100% for the program. I would like the $50 a year and to implement it. If it's June 1st is the date, I think that's the date we should go with. I think good work, David. Okay, I, I'm going to at this point motion to table this until next meeting. Um, I, I, is there a call for action on our part? There is not. And okay. Just as a, a quick thank you to the staff, we've got a lot of folks that have had some hands in this, but Jared Alec has really put a lot of effort into this and has really been driving the bus on it. And so. Jamie. And yes, Jamie Penley yeah, from the police yes. department, Scott and Sarah both from right. legal. So right. a lot, of, lot of great work into this. So, so I guess I want to make it very clear here before we end the discussion on this for those who are sitting out there thinking, oh, gosh, it's, it's being put off again. Um, you don't get two swings at this, and we want to make sure that we're, we're go going to – we want to make sure that we accomplish what we want to accomplish with this and that it has teeth. So that said, um, what are we doing? Last items on the agenda are the consent agenda. Consent, consent items, yes. So and you have – uh, yes. Six consent items, yes. sir. Yes, to read those in. So the first item is a contract that I executed with Spring. Oh, Do you need to vote? No, no, no that, that was no action. No action. Do oh, you want to, to table. Did you say table it? Or? I, think I it asked just, if we needed to table it. And, and, um, no, we don't have to. Yeah. Well, it's just yeah. a discussion item. Right. Yeah, yeah we got it. Um, so we have uh, six consent items. Yes. So uh, first item on consent agenda is a contract that I signed with Spring Grove Cemetery for an indigent burial in the amount of $795. The next items are all new hires, the first being a management analyst, uh, an individual named Caleb Peterson, at a rate of $21.64 per hour. Then we have a firefighter at uh, Mr. Gavin Shannon at a rate of $18.20 per hour. A police or a code enforcement officer in the police department, a Mr. Stanley Schmail, at twenty-three dollars and eight cents per hour. A code enforcement specialist in the police department, Nick Hopewell, at fifteen dollars per hour. And a cadet in the police department, Mr. Zach Getz, at fifteen dollars an hour. And something to note about Mr. Getz is that when he passes his uh, 
Opata tests and becomes a certified police officer. The assumption with this motion is that he will be promoted to the rank of police officer at a rate of $30.29 per hour. And I would recommend approval of the consent agenda. I motion we approve the consent agenda as described by um, Administrator Weckbach. I second. All right, any discussion? None. None. All right, uh, we'll call for the vote. Ms. Ulrich? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes, those items A through F is provided in your packet pass 3 0. Uh, Mr. Baker, would you like to provide us with a fiscal report? I don't have a report, uh, board, but I did want to just um, mention um, how hard we're working on public records requests. On October the 17th, we received 17 public records requests alone from, <clears throat> from one person. And uh, those records requests were fulfilled within three days. So, um, and I, I mention this quite often, but um, that's, that's a number that we received in one day from one person that's more than um, Green Township gets in a year. So that's how hard we're, we're keeping up with public records. Thank you for uh, continuing to you. meet that challenge, Jeff. Yes. Very right. challenging. Need for an executive session? I do not believe there's a need. Is there a motion? I would motion that we would adjourn the meeting at 9.18 p.m. I would second that. All right. Uh, Mr. Baker, please call the roll on that. Ms. Orch? Yes. Mr. Unger? Yes. Mr. Waller? Yes. Adjourned at 9.18.